Hello everybody and welcome to Sunoikis' Digital Classics 2017. Today is our first common session of our Spring 2017 course. We have 24 weeks and this year our common sessions are scheduled every Thursday at 5 p.m. Um, Central European time. You can find the schedule and the syllabus uh, on uh, GitHub. And I have to say, I'm very happy to say that this is our fourth Sunoikis' Digital Classics course because we had two courses, uh, one in the spring 2015, the other in 2016, but now we also have a new track of Sunoikis' in London, uh, thanks to Gabriel Boudard, who is, leading the, who is leading this new track. And last fall, for 2016, we had a course uh, developing London. And now we are starting our fourth Sunoikis' Digital Classics course. Today, as I said, we have our first session, which is about uh, geo annotation. We have uh, two session coordinators, uh, Chiara Palladino from the University of Leipzig and Bari, and Val Valeria Vitale from the Institute of Classical Studies in uh, London. You have uh, uh, the description in the class outline, the description of the session of today with readings and exercises. And today, so we see uh, our uh, guests will talk about uh, annotations in general and specifically about uh, annotating uh, geodata. But um, Chiara and Valeria, welcome and thank you for contributing to Sunoikisis. I don't know who's going to start, but... Uh, yeah, I should be starting. Okay, Chiara. Uh, well. Just confirm me very quickly that you can hear me. Yes, that I can I really hear you. Okay, great. And uh, you can uh, uh, share your screen. Uh, in the class yes. line, we have a link to your slides in Google. That? Yes, perfect. We can okay. see the slides. Thank you. So, um, as Monica mentioned, thank you, Monica. Uh, we are going to have this first session on geo annotation, that is, annotating uh, geospatial information in early texts and texts belonging to um, the pre modern era, essentially, antiquity and late antiquity. And we are going to focus on how to work with this type of textual information on several types of documents, images, maps, and text-bearing objects, uh, which means that we are essentially going to work with um, texts. That means that we are not going to focus on any type of, represent of graphic representation of such annotations. If you want to see um, some cool graphic stuff about that, uh, I would advise you to follow the following sessions in Sunoikis because we're going to have a follow-up on that and show you how to apply this kind of geo annotation to representation of spatial information in maps and in other types of uh, images and graphic representation. So um, annotating geospatial information in early documents. Uh, first of all, we are going to introduce you to a general outline of what geography is for the past, for antiquity and late antiquity, uh, just to give you um, an idea of the very different kind of conception of space that we have um, in antiquity and in pre-modern societies in general, we are going to focus on the domains that are essentially more familiar to us, but this doesn't mean that you cannot apply these kind of concepts to other types of document. So we can focus on Greco-Roman and Arabic geographies, for example, but you uh, will be able to apply the same methodologies to any kind of pre-modern document or source that you want to work with. Um, so geography, or in the pre-modern world, um, has some very different aspects in the conception of space uh, from our modern way of seeing space. Um, as for the Greco-Roman world, we have uh, some quite defined types of written documents or written sources uh, that bear this type of geographical or geospatial information that you can find listed here. 
And these types of these types of sources are um, just to give you an overview of what we're talking about. Uh, they can have different types of structures in their texts. For example, the one that is considered the most ancient uh, of these types of sources is the Periply, that are essentially lists of places along the coastal line that essentially reproduce an actual itinerary, so an actual way of traveling along the coast. And for example, Arian wrote a Periplus. Um, then we have the literally guided tours around the Perigeses or Periodois, such as the one that Pausanias wrote, that are more focused on the mainland and do not follow a specific order of travel or itinerary, but in the other way, they are filled with um, additional types of information, cultural information, uh, information about the monuments, historical information, and so on. Um, then there is um, quite ambiguous type, which is called the chorographia, that is between the graphic representation of the world on maps, and we will talk about that more in detail, and a very focused regional representation or description of space. And then we have pretty much a Roman equivalent of the Periply, which is itineraria, that are essentially lists of stations uh, followed by distances that are not on the coastal line, but in the mainland, and follow essentially the Roman road network. Um, then we have the more literary geographies that are comprehensive geographies that also include any type of scientific cartographic information about um, how to describe space, how to describe, uh, I don't know, meteorological information and so on, such as the geographies that were written by Pliny or Strabo. Um, and then we have a variety of geospatial information that is um, the privileged target of text-bearing objects. We have uh, historical documents, historical inscriptions that bear some kind of very important geospatial information that gives the spatial context of that um, historical source, such as the Marmorparium. We have Roman funerary inscriptions that have very important information about, for example, provenances of the people. We have maps, obviously. We have late antique reproductions of maps, Arabic maps that we're going, which is a topic that we're going to cover, and so on. So, uh, one thing that I would really like to focus on in order to give you um, an idea of the importance of annotating geospatial information into these types of documents and sources is that um, the way of conceiving space in pre-modern societies is very different from. Um, our way of, of conceiving space. Pre-modern geographies are essentially non-mapped geographies. What does this mean? That wayfinding and traveling processes are non, not based on the use of maps. Uh, and by maps, we mean cartographic maps first. Um, although the Greeks and the Arabs in particular knew cartography very well, and they were able to draw cartographic maps of the world. They were used for different purposes than traveling, than actual wayfinding. They were used for um, giving an idea of the shape of the world, for example, so for philosophical purposes. They were used for religious purposes. They were used for administrative purposes, obviously, in empire-like dimensions. While on the other hand, the actual traveling is, as cognitive processes and as ways of conceiving space, um, belong to the so-called hodological vision of space, which is essentially a way of conceiving space in a linear, um, according to a linear itinerary, uh, which would be a very similar way of conceiving space to that that you would have if you had to give some kind of indications to um, one person that asked you, for example, the way to go from school to the central station. Now imagine that you have to do the same thing to describe the itinerary to go from Rome to Madrid, for example. And you can see here that you would need a very precise system of geographical references, just spatial references, landmarks, and so on, in order to give, you, to give such an information without the help of any kind of, of uh, grammati uh, sorry, diagrammatical uh, or graphic representation of the world. Um, but what I want to stress here is because of that, because of this um, contrast between the hodological vision of space and the cartographic vision of space, um, descriptions of space, of geography in word form, uh, so in, in uh, 
discursive way were very empirical because they served an empirical purpose. They were very functional because obviously you have to know where you're going uh, if you follow a description of space. And therefore, they had to be, um, hence the importance of, um, for us to understand what uh, geographical descriptions in texts and in literary sources mean. And just to clarify this, the, the reason why this vision is completely different for us as modern, the moderns and for the ancients is that we essentially conceive the world in, uh, according to the cognitive idea of a map. We are surrounded by maps. We do not conceive the idea of walking without some kind of visual representation of the world that we move in. Which obviously doesn't mean that cartography doesn't exist in antiquity. Uh, but it just means that it served a different purpose. Uh, and by a different purpose, I mean that it could be, for example, philosophical. Now, when you try to draw for yourself a shape of the world, that can also serve your, you know, your imaginary, your um, way of conceiving the universe in a certain way, your way to um, establish some kind of conceptual boundaries of the world that you know, what you don't know, and so on. So uh, I always find this um, piece of Gatemer's sketch of geography quite exemplary of the situation. Um, in philosophy, uh, the idea of a diagrammatic representation of the world is probably one of the first uh, historical ideas that um, become quite mature quite early. So uh, the ancient philosophers had a pretty precise idea that the world could be represented into a drawing or into uh, a graphical representation. But obviously, this doesn't mean that they use this same representation to travel. And as you can see here, Agatemero says, Democritus perceived that the earth was oblong. Uh, Dicarchus agreed with him, Eudoxus made the length double the breadth, Herotosthenes more than double, and then we go to the paradox, Crates semicircular, Hipparchus trapezoid, others in the shape of a tail, Posidonius is so sling shaped and so on. So this is that this way of representing the world in a, some kind of graphic form doesn't serve functional concrete purposes. In fact, the types of maps that we have um, from modern societies in general are much more similar to cartograms than to uh, actual maps. Um, but this is also the reason why they are important as well, uh, because they represent some kind of imagination of space that obeys to a very precise um, ensemble of concepts, ensemble of cultural concepts. Uh, and this is actually the reproduction uh, in a Byzantine document of what could have been a um, presentation of the map in a 5th century historian, Ephorus. Uh, and you can see, obviously, that it's something very different from an actual cartograph cartographic map, map of the world. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't convey some kind of spatial information. Um, so, for example, here you can see that uh, the map represents the boundaries of the known world, and it associates them to um, people, essentially. So you can see the Indians, the Celts, the Ethiopians, and the Scythians. Also note that the directions are inverted with respect to our usual maps. The south is uh, in the upper part of the map, the north is in the what would usually be for our maps, and so on. Um, so these maps are pretty much cartograms. Uh, and cartograms are, uh, for example, very similar to the types of spatial representations that you would see in a subway or at a bus station. These are representations of only certain aspects of space that obviously do not mean to give you a concrete help in uh, wayfinding, but they define an, a set of landmarks, a set of key indications to the space that are enough for you to have a general picture of the space that you move in. Um, and these are examples that come from another dimension, obviously. These are Arabic, uh, let's say not maps, but diagrammatic representations of cities. And as you can see, there are uh, only certain key features 
to the cities that you see here. Uh, there are the main roads, uh, there are certain landmarks that are represented by, for example, the boundaries or uh, key buildings and so on. So these are the types of representation that you would find uh, in pre-modern societies, and they are obviously not enough for people to travel. Um, now, in um, empire-like dimensions, such as the Roman world, you would have, um, surviving at least, some slightly better maps. Um, and this is the Tabula Poitingeriana, which is a late antique reproduction of a map uh, apparently of the Roman Empire. I'm not going into chronological details about this, let's just say that it's a very debated um, map of one stage of the Roman Empire, which ideally uh, should have represented a whole empire with the Roman road network, with the provinces, with the regional distribution and so on. Um, but this doesn't mean that this map was used to provide travelers um, an actual method of wayfinding. Uh, first of all, because it was very big, so it was probably meant for exposition in external areas, in buildings and so on. But also because if you have a look at it, um, that, that type of map always reminds me of another very famous, um, let's say, imaginary map, Tolkien's map of Middle Earth, because this is pretty much the same um, diagrammatic convention that you would have in a map of an imaginary, in this case, an imaginary world, with certain key features uh, described in the graphic uh, document, but not actually meant to give you an idea about how to move in that space. So would you consider traveling in Pittsburgh, for example, with a map that bears the same cartographic conventions? And this is actually a map that a user on Reddit reproduced by using uh, the same conventions that Tolkien used. Maybe you would. At one point, you would probably need Google Maps telling you where to turn left, because that is obviously not enough for you to move across space. Uh, so as a consequence, as we said, the problem is to conceive a system that has to be in word form, that has to be discursive, in order to allow travelers to find a way without a map. And I tried to summarize um, the key features of this system into um, this slide that you see here. There are some key features that are very important for the documents that we work with. Uh, obviously, the first one is distances. Um, you have to cover a certain distance in order to go from this place to this place. And obviously, in very concrete and functional documents, the numerical estimate of the distance depends on the concrete conditions of travel. Um, you can also have several units of measurement in the widest way possible. You can have different units in the same document, you can have different units in the same chronological span and so on. And obviously, <clears throat> the distances sometimes also describe very precise connecting routes um they can establish connections between different entities uh which can be settlements which can be regions which can, can be provinces which can be uh natural features on the coastal line and so on then we have the system of orientation which is essentially the system that you use in order to know in which direction to go um and this system of orientation can respond to a fixed um system which essentially uh belongs to, to some key kinds of um, reference points, such as the winds, stars, um, the cardinal points, and so on. Or it can be unfixed, which means that it's dependent on the environment. So for example, you associate a mountain to a landmark um, at this mountain turn left, for example. Or it can be culture-based, which is very frequent in urban spaces, obviously. It can take main roads um, or very important buildings as landmarks. Then there is a key aspect that is peculiar to empire-like dimensions, which is the segmentation of space uh, that also bears a uh, politic and cultural um, importance because in an empire, the segmentation of space is particularly, is, is crucial for administrative purposes, for tax purposes. Um, for political purposes in a word. So you can have a distribution of space at various levels. It can be provinces, it can be administrative divisions, it can be regions, it can be settlements, it can be cities and so on. And there is some sort of a hier hierarchy in this kind of segmentation. And 
in a way, there is uh, something that, um, some kind of knowledge, some kind of cultural knowledge behind all of this system that um, can be resumed in the cultural aspects of, of, of spatial practice in a world how places are defined, how places are categorized. So why a place is associated to the category of an island, um, why a place is associated to the category of a boundary, or to, you know, more vague cultural categories like danger. This place is dangerous because it is inhabited by barbarian peoples, for example, and so on. So what we want to stress is that this kind of narrative is as systematic as cartography can be. Um, it is a system developed by a community to help people find a way across the landscape. Um, it is empirical, obviously, but at the same time, it is culture specific because it is conceived and shared by a community. So it is encoded in a way that only that society could understand. Hence, our difficulty in having a comprehensive understanding of this kind of narrative. So our challenge is to understand how space is conceived in a society that is definitely not ours. And now let's go to annotating geospatial documents. First of all, well, let's clear up the landscape about the definition of annotation. What is an annotation? An annotation is basically a statement that someone, which can be a scholar, a student, anyone, makes about something, uh, which in our case is a document. And it basically establishes a connection between a document, a source, whatever, an object, which is a target, and a body, which is something related to the content of the target. So it basically establishes a connection between the text and um, some kind of external authority. Uh, which can be a gazetteer, which can be an authority list, an internal authority list, and so on. And you can have two types of annotation, basically. Um, an external or standoff annotation, uh, which basically means that the annotation is placed in a different location than the document being annotated. Or as inline markup, which is data and annotations are stored in the same place, in the same document, for example. To be clear, if you annotate a document uh, in the traditional way, I mean, what usually happens is that you find, for example, two place names, Athens and Sparta, and you want to associate them to some kind of external authority that bears more information about them. Now, in the digital world, this would be a reference to um, a gazetteer, which is an external authority that bears, that not only allows you to disambiguate that place, so to identify that in a stable way, uh, but also as allows you to associate to that place uh, a number of other information. You can do this on a document, on a literary source, but you can also do the same if you're working on images that bear some kind of geospatial information. You can do the same if you're working on uh, text-bearing sources. Uh, so, for example, this is an image of the Marmor Parium, and if you can find some kind of geospatial information in here, you can do pretty much the same work um, as in any other type of source that bears some kind of, you know, text. So, a geo annotation uh, means essentially that the type of authority that you refer to when you are annotating some kind of geospatial information in a document is essentially a gazetteer or some kind of authority list that has the same features of a gazetteer that stores as unique identifiers or URIs. Um, and when you annotate your document, when you annotate a place in your document and refer it to that URI, to that external authority, your annotation automatically complies to a canonical reference. It is disambiguated, it is uniquely identified with something um, that is stable, and it is usable for other people. Not only it is usable for other people, but it allows you to have some kind of associated information that you wouldn't have otherwise, which is the, the kind of information that is stored already in the gazetteer. Now, some examples of inline notation. The classical example here would be uh, the annotation of uh, place names in TI Epidoc. And I'm just going to cover this very superficially because uh, you will see some more detailed examples in the session about uh, digital editing. Um, 
So when you find basically a place name uh, in a document and you want to mark it in T following the TIP doc conventions, uh, you can annotate uh, such toponyms at a variety of uh, granularity, let's say. So you can just annotate the place name, uh, and which can be absolute or relative, um, or you can give it some some more precise uh, definition. So it can be you can characterize it as a geographical feature. Uh, you can use obviously various categories of nestings. You can specify the type by using the attribute type. So you can try to define that the place name or the spatial indication that you find in your document with a fair amount of precision. Now, obviously, when you do this, it would be good practice for you also to uh, reference to an authority, as we said, because otherwise you would just have a list of place names with no external reference, no disambiguations and so on. So your annotation in that case is pure markup and it doesn't establish any type of connection to any other um, external reference. Um, and when you encode your text in TI or Epidoc, you can refer to an authority list basically in two ways. You can establish your own authority list, which would be internal, indicated with list place, um, that can have some kind of additional information like the relationships defined between those places, or, and a reference which would be good practice uh, and I would recommend that you can have a reference to an external authority list such as the gazetteers for example by using the ref attribute the ref attribute points to an external database uh, so for example play it is to the URL that is referring to the place that you are annotating and there you can refer to this kind of controlled information. So again, the classical type of annotation that we described at the beginning. Um, there are other additional, additional types of information that you can have. So for example, if your name, uh, as it recurs in the source, uh, doesn't, have, doesn't follow a canonical form of the name, uh, you can refer to that canonical, canonical form by using uh, the, type, the, the attribute name ref tag other features, uh, you can tag relations between places, you can tag uh, indications of descriptions of locations, you can encode distances, and so on. And just to clarify, since we are going to uh, also talk about Arabic documents, there are also other ways of doing uh, inline annotation, not necessarily following uh, TIAP doc. You can also follow, if you are annotating documents in Arabic, you can also follow the markdown conventions that um, is essentially a system used to tag your spatial information to, of various types um, through the means of inline annotation again. And you can basically annotate um, provinces the types of the provinces, the regions, the settlements that are in those provinces. You can annotate uh, distances. You can annotate a variety of spatial information, obviously also toponyms and so on. Now we are going to focus on external annotation, which would be the focus of our practical exercise and of our tutorial. Um, the reason why we do this is because um, nothing being wrong with you marking places in Epidoc or TI, uh, sometimes uh, it would be preferable to use external annotations. Um, there are tools available out there that are that are at the very high standards for doing such type of work, and it may be also more fun for you as students to do that. Uh, and we are going to present to you a way to perform external annotation on early geospatial documents that has been conceived within uh, the Pelagios project. Um, the Pelagios project, uh, which is an acronym that means Pelagios Enabling Tensioned Geodata in Open Systems, by the way, you don't have to know this, um, um, was originally born as a project in order to allow users and researchers to have access to different types of data uh, and resources about the ancient world um, by focusing on the concept of places. Um, it, wanted, it wants to use linked open data methods to give access to this kind of, of interconnection of data. Uh, basically, linked open data provides um, a technology to link online resources together uh, by means of a common concept, of a common reference, which in this case would be uh, exactly places. 
and in the Pelagius project is that it, it wants to ensure connections through ancient world research resources through the places that they refer to. So ideally, through Pelagius, when you find a place in a document, you should be able through linked open data technologies and through a partnership, obviously, with Pelagius, to have access to a variety of additional information about that place that come from a variety of research databases <clears throat> belonging to antiquity or late antiquity studies. So when you find a place in a document, you should be able to retrieve information about the same place from text databases, from inscriptions, from any kind of text bearing ob object, archaeological finds, archaeological sites, and so on, or any other online resources that bears a relation to that particular place. Uh, we had several stages um, in Pelagios, and the current stage is that we became commons. Um, the aim of Pelagios Commons is to be more focused on community research, essentially. So, um, we want to provide not only an infrastructure for linked open geodata, as I mentioned before, but also uh, to create an authentic community that is actively engaged and interacts into um, various types of research focusing on uh, space, let's say, geospatial information. Um, and obviously, not only we want to have such a community, such a discussion, in which case I would advise you to go to commonspelagios.org to see what that is about. And if you have a problem, you can share that uh, with the community through the forums. But also, obviously, the aim is to provide such a community of the tools and of the resources um, that can, may be useful in order to perform some kind of geospatial research. Um, so you can use, through Pelagios Commons, you can use uh, the platform for annotating your special documents. You can have access to the map tiles that have been produced by the team, uh, or you can just explore the community data and the data that are provided, provided by the partners um, by having um, a, a look, for example, to the experimental tool, which is called Peripleo, that is used to explore um, community data that refer to certain kinds of entities or objects or places again. And obviously, you can also participate with your own data. So if you have some kind of geospatial data, you can think about how to participate to that community. And so during this last stage, um, we developed a pretty much intense second stage development of uh, the tool that I mentioned in order to perform geo-annotation on early spatial documents. Um, and this tool is named Recogito and will be the focus of the second part um uh, and of our exercise so this will be the tutorial and now i should leave room to valeria that will explain you about the cogito thank you chiara uh, can you hear me yes great um okay let me share my screen So before uh, I start talking a little bit more about Recogito, which is the tool that we chose for our uh, exercise, I want to say quickly a few words about gazetteers, because as uh, Chiara um, explained, I mean, they play a fundamental role uh, in the geo annotation, and I just wanted to uh, say a few words more about it. And um, because we have very little time, I cannot talk about the many gazetteers that are uh, out there, but I will focus on Pleiades as an example. Pleiades is the gazetteer for the, for the ancient world, and it's, I think, the most used resource um, in uh, uh, digital geography for the ancient world. Uh, but bear in mind that, you know, there are other things out there, so I will use Pleiades uh, as an example to talk a little bit more generally about gazetteer and what you actually find um, on, a, on the page of a, of a gazetteer. Um, 
and um, why digital gazetteer can um, actually uh, help us um, studying, understanding and representing the information that we have about the ancient world. So Pleiades uh, started as a digitization project of the Barrington Atlas that uh, you probably know is this printed um, edition of uh, maps of the ancient world. It's um, a remarkable piece of work. So um, clearly everyone was very really happy to have it in a digital form because it was uh, way more accessible and it was you know, online and for free. Uh, of course, there are a lot of, um, there is a lot of uh, more added value to that, that play this project brought to the simple digitization of the Barrington Atlas. It is a collaborative project while remaining authoritative because there is an editorial board. It publishes data under open license so that anyone can download the data and process them further and use them for their own uh, research. And that's already, I think, a huge step forward. But I want to add that digital gazetteers and play this in particular um, also offer you know, an, uh, a further added value that is they seem to be better fitted to represent the nature of geographical information about the ancient world that as uh, Chiara uh, showed is uh, a, a very particular kind of information is fragmentary, um, is partial, is um, sometimes uh, it's difficult to say where the literature uh, and the fiction ends and where the history begins, especially because the concept of geography and history in the ancient world was pretty much uh, different from um, what, we, what we think about it now. Um, so, uh, how do we use gazetteers and how gazetteers, the online ones, can help us? Um, representing and collecting um, and correlating this information. Um, so the model that uh, Pleiades uh, experimented, which I think is particularly efficient, is a sort of tripartition of the concept of the geographical information. So in, in Pleiades we find um, that these three parts that are the place, the names of the location, they are handled separately. And of course, then they can be related to each other when there is a relationship, but they can also be um, absolutely independent uh, one from the other. Um, so the place is, uh, in a way, maybe the platonic idea of the place, if you like. So it's the notion that um, there was a place, or there was, or that people believed there was uh, a place. And then we have names, uh, which are how uh, the place used to be called, or is still called, by different people and or at different time uh, of um, history. And then we have location, uh, where a place is or used to be according to different sources, and maybe the location you know, also changed uh, during time. But to, to make things a little bit more clear, let's have a look at an actual uh, play this page. Oh, uh, before we go there, uh, a quick overview of the information that you can actually find in Pleiades. Uh, most of it, as you would expect, is about settlements and centers of human activity, but you also find entries for uh, regions and areas and other sort of political or administrative entities, but also geographical features like mountains, rivers and um, lakes. Um, Human-made features, uh, especially big monuments like temples or theatres or other things like that. And lost peoples um, that were in some documents used as geographical information, like the land of the Ethiopians or um, information like this. Um, okay, now uh, actually let's go and have a look at um, a play of this page. And I've chosen the place, the page for Taras, ancient Taras, that is modern city Taranto in Italy. Um, and you see that in the page, we are in the page related to the place. And we identify that we are uh, in the place page because of this icon of the little temple. It tells us that we are looking at the information about the place Taras. What do we find in the page for, for Taras? A map, of course. And we find various locations, and we know that we're talking about locations because we can see this little compass here that identifies the location. We could 
click on each of these locations, we will go to a, a separate page that deals uh, with the location. And here we have the various names uh, that, that have been associated with the place Taras uh, in time. Uh, we also see um, the things that are bigger than Taras, uh, of which Taras is part, and potentially the things that are in Taras. Like, for example, if we had an entry for the Temple of Poseidon in Taras, we will find it in this uh, section. But probably the most important thing that you can find in this uh, page is, um, as Chera was saying, the URI. So it is the unique resource identifier that has been associated to the place Taras in the Pleiades Gazetteer. It means that each time that we talk, that we find a reference to Taras in the text or in the other sources that we're using in the maps that we are annotating, we can refer to Taras using this unique code that uh, is associated with, with Taras. And in this way, we can, in a linked open data environment, we can um, see all the other um, annotation, all the other information being related to Taras using the same URI. And just to give you a very, very quick example of this, uh, on the right side of the page, you see this picture of Taras that the API of Playbus has uh, found because it was um, uh, it was tagged with the Pleiades URI for Taras on Flickr, uh, also obviously using the, um, uh, the right uh, vocabulary. But you see that automatically this information that was related to Taras through the URI has been associated to it. And this is uh, the, you know, if we were virtually scrolling down uh, the page for Taras, we could see another fundamental component of a playlist page, with our, which are, you know, the references. Um, and you, you wouldn't um, create or publish anything in Pleiades without adding uh, references, uh, as in any kind of scholarly publication. Now, let's have a closer look at the name page. And we know that we are in a name page because we can see the icon of the tab here. We are in the, in the page for the name Solus of the place Salut. And um, you find the um, attested name and the transcription and uh, who is responsible for the annotation and, again, um, the evidence because uh, each name needs uh, an annotation in ancient sources if it's an ancient name or in uh, more modern um, sources if it's a modern name. But what we have seen so far, uh, both uh, the example of Terrace and Salentum actually were our best case scenario because we have there the place, we have the location, sometimes even more than one, and we have names. Uh, but what is, I think, uh, extremely useful in this um, uh, separation of the concept that we find in play this is that we can actually um, uh, deal with information that is incomplete when one of these components or even two of these components are actually missing. Uh, so for example, uh, a place that we know existed or we know that people believe existed, like I don't know, the island of Calypso, for example, uh, but we don't know exactly where that was, if there was an what is its modern uh, actual geographical name? Or we can have only the name. We find the attestation of the name on a coin or an inscription, but we have no idea of the exact uh, location of the history of the place. Sometimes we could even have a location only because we know that something was there because it's materially there. We have maybe the ruins of a bridge, but we don't know anything about that. We don't know the name we didn't know the historical or cultural context. But a digital resource like Pleiades um, allows us to deal with this information, we deal, to deal with this richness, with this complexity, and uh, you can easily imagine how difficult would that be to include all this kind of uh, fuzziness in a printed publication. But also a digital gazetteer like Playbase allows us to represent, for example, evolution. Uh, for example, how the boundaries and the locations of a place change through time. And alternatives uh, like, for example, the names evolved. Um, 
this is one of my favorite features uh, in Playlist. And you know, place names can can go really really crazy sometimes. You have different languages, both ancient and modern. You have variant spellings that are all important to to record for historical for philological reason. And sometimes you just have uh, different groups of people uh, calling the same thing with different names just because there was much communication among them. I'm talking especially about uh, different nationality of uh, excavation teams. And just to give you a very, very um, quick example of how many different names and how diverse they can be. This is a list of the variant names uh, for the same building in Pompeii. And you see that in you know, relatively a uh, small amount of time that place has been called in, with names that sometimes really don't have anything uh, to do with each other, including the House of the Dwarfs, that um, it's by far my favorite. But okay, now that I've given you um, a little introduction to um, gazetteers and URI and why it is important to relate our geographical annotation to unique identifiers. I'm going to switch to talking about Rikagito. Um, percent. Okay, that's the right one. So we have chosen uh, Rikugito as a tool for this exercise. Um, it's not the only option out there, but it's the one that we have um, chosen because, well, it's free, uh, it's online, so you don't need to install anything. It's fairly simple to use. Um, it can be used on different kinds of sources, text, images, tabular data, and it allows a certain amount of collaboration, which we thought was very, very interesting. I would look you quite quickly uh, through um, a few examples so that after the talk you will be uh, perfectly able to do the exercise. But again, this would be also a pretext to talk a little bit more about G annotation and the, let's say, more practical uh, aspect of it. Um, so Rikagito 2, it's an online platform for digital annotation of named entities. It was developed within the Pelagius uh, project and in particular of geographical, um, in particular for geographical annotation. Um, it works on, um, uh, on various kind of sources and it allows to uh, visualize the annotation directly on the map and to export data in various formats so that you can subsequently process them. Um, but we will see, um, we will see all of this. Uh, I will, we will go um, uh, through Rikagito uh, step by step. Um, and while I show you the major features of Rikagito, I would ask you to start thinking of how can you use the how can you use this tool? How can you use this kind of annotation to improve your research? How can you apply these kind of features to your own data? Uh, um, okay, uh, this this will be useful later on when you will think about your your exercise. So let's get started. First of all, we need to create an account. I am assuming that all the people uh, here and now online already have one. In case you don't, please go ahead and make one. It's very quick. You don't need any confirmation. You can just uh, register and start using uh, Rikagito. Uh, when you have an account, you can start uploading your own documents. And this might be the most efficient um, option. Uh, especially for the exercise because at that point you will be working on the data that you know and you will be able to ask maybe more relevant questions um, um, about geographical uh, geographical information uh, but what we um, what we wanted to to try uh, today was uh, some sort of collaborative annotation that is uh, enabled uh, by Rikagito uh, but um, only uh, via annotation. That's why we have asked you to uh, give us your uh, username so we could enable you to um, edit the document with us. You will find uh, there is a 
Synergis is the C um, account on Recogito where we have uploaded both some text and some images. Uh, you will find those documents in your share with me folder if you have uh, given us uh, your, um, your username and feel free to, to work with that, especially if you don't have um, a data set of your own uh, right now, so uh, please use our, our account. I know that there are people that will be watching this um, later on during the year. Um, that's not a problem. The documents will stay online, and even if you ask us later uh, to be enabled, we will uh, invite you to, to add it. So, um, I will move to the Sinoikis' Rikigito account. Um, and let's, um, let's pretend that we want to, uh, no, not pretend, let's actually upload a new document. Let's start with a text document. And I've chosen something that is really, really, really classic. You can't go any uh, more classic than that, which is the book first of the Odyssey. And what you do when you want to upload a text source is to um, find a digital version of it. Uh, of course, um, I usually go to Wikisource uh, because I know that I don't have to worry too much about copyright for what is there. And uh, please bear in mind that even though it is very, very um, common that ancient sources are actually free of copyright, you cannot assume the same for translations. So uh, please uh, bear that in mind. Um, theoretically, you can upload any kind of document uh, to Recogito as long as you are the only person that is seeing and annotating that. But if you want to make them public and to share them with everyone so that they are visible to everyone, then you must ensure that the copyright of the document allow you uh, to do so. So I have chosen um, uh, an old translation of, um, of Homer. Um, yes. Okay, so it's our, I would say, book one. Um, you could add more uh, metadata, but let's, uh, let's do this uh, uh, quickly and we can push next and we choose a file that we have prepared already. Okay. I have prepared uh, in downloads. At the moment, the only uh, format that uh, Recogito import for text is TXT. So ensure that you can save or export in this format. I have used the um, I have used Google Docs, for example. There were uh, no problems with that. And we choose. Okay, and we are ready to go. You see that we Recogito is asking us if we want to apply some automatic annotation to it. Uh, it means that Recogito will perform a sort of preliminary name entity recognition. It will try to uh, find the, the, the names of places and people and for the places to suggest us uh, a match. Um, why should we uh, allow Rikagito to do so? Well, uh, why not save some, some time uh, letting the machine do some work for us? Um, so let's see how Rikagito um, does with our uh, Odyssey book. Voila. Okay, we find our Odyssey here. Okay. So Rikikito has actually recognized, you can see they are kind of highlighted, but still gray, uh, some places uh, and some people. Um, okay, good. Um, it has, quite surprisingly, is Troy. So let's, let's do our first annotation on, on Troy. Uh, to do your annotation, you basically, um, highlight uh, the word uh, as in any um, word processor. And when you release, there is this little window that appears and all your annotation will happen in this window. So what we want to tell um, is that Troy is a place. So we click here. Uh, but Recogito also uh, gives us the opportunity not only to say that Troy was a place, but also to say 
the Troy is exactly that Troy, that place that we can find in a gazetteer. So that has been already identified and disambiguated in the gazetteer. So I'm not entirely sure this is our right Troy. Uh, this is an automatic match. Let's see what are the, the options that we have. Let, let's click on change. Okay, I think that the Troy we're talking of is this Ilium Troya that we find in Pleiades. You see, we have various gazetteers as opportunities, but I would stick with Pleiades, which is specific for the ancient world. So when we are, um, when we are fairly sure that we do have a match, we click on it. Uh, yes, we, we choose Pleiades and okay. So what happens now? Um, Ricky Gito is again trying to do a little bit of work for us. It asks if we want to apply the same annotation to all the occurrences of the same word. So in this case, uh, we might be inclined to say yes, because I mean, it's, it's the Odyssey. We are fairly confident that the Troy we're talking about, it's always the same Troy. Uh, so we can say yes. You see that the color of our annotation is green, it, which means that it has been geo-resolved. That, that, that means that we have associated to our place um, an actual, um, we have established a relation with a gazetteer. So we have attached to this word, Troy, all the information related to Troy that are in the gazetteer, in the play this gazetteer in our case. So location and alternative names and bibliography and so on. And in this case, it was kind of uh, useful uh, to uh, to reapply the same thing, but this automatic uh, computation should be used uh, cautiously because, for example, what happens if we want to geo-resolve Ithaca, which is one of the places that um, Rikogito had automatically recognized? Um, well, uh, we could just click confirm, but let's see uh, all the options that we have just to be more clear. Okay, at this point, if we try to resolve it, we see that we actually have two Ithaca. Are we talking about Ithaca the island or Ithaca the settlement? And you might think that in this case it's really not a big deal because they, might, they are you know, used maybe interchangeably in this specific text. But remember that uh, sometimes completely different geographical entities have the, the same identical name, like uh, for example settlements and rivers that share the same name. So be careful before reapplying uh, the same um, the same annotation to all the occurrences. And um, even more so, um, when we are annotating um, geographical information that is not explicit, um, the place, uh, the name of a place, uh, the name of a city, the name of a country, but we are annotating a noun, a pronoun, an adverb that we are using, that is used in the text uh, to give uh, geographical information. So, for example, uh, in the Odyssey, if we are talking about here home, uh, we know that we're talking about Ulysses' home, so we could resolve this again with Ithaca. No, we want to change. Let's say, let's say the island. Okay, but we definitely don't want all the time, all the times that the word home appears in this text to be resolved with Ithaca, because we have more heroes and they all have homes. When we have um, done a substantial number of annotations, uh, let's leave um, the Odyssey because it's not, um, we don't have enough annotations on that. Uh, let's, um, let's look at this one. We can uh, use this feature of Rikugito that will plot our um, annotations in the text uh, on a map on a geographical view. And this is a very simple, straightforward visualization of our data, but I think that it already gives um, a little bit of um, input about uh, the nature and the distribution of the annotation. It also, um, maybe this is, this is an, uh, extremely clear in this visualization, but the, the size of the circles is proportional to the number of annotations related to that place. So if we click on one of the, of the dots, um, okay, we have only one here. Let's try a bigger one. Okay, we have 15 annotations about the same place and we can look at 
done one by one with a little bit of context. And if we want to see the fuller context, we click on jump to text and we are taken to the exact place where that annotation is in the text. Um, okay, now let's move to annotating um, another source that are images. And when talking about images, maybe maps are the most obvious uh, think uh, the thing that you can think of, but there is a, a, a richness of geographical information on other kind of um, sources as well that can be processed as images. So, uh, for example, in mosaics or in paintings or in tapestry, you find representations of cities, you find representations of famous landmarks, or even sometimes um, personification of, uh, of places or kingdoms or things like that. So, um, we will deal with maps right now, but uh, it's, not the only, it's not the only option. Um, so if we click on the map, we are working now on the um, trans Latin transcription of the uh, Arabic uh, maps of the board uh, um, produced by uh, Ali Drisi. Um, we can zoom in and out and we can rotate the image um, holding uh, shift and alt. And if you forget the shortcuts always every single time like I do, you can click on help and it's a quite handy uh, reminder for that. Um, so, um, because text on maps is uh, often uh, oriented in uh, uh, different ways, um, I think that the most uh, useful uh, tool to annotate uh, the image and the map is the tilt box. Um, what you can do with a keto when annotating um, an image is basically selecting an area of the image that can be um, the name um, that, that you can read or it can be maybe um, a more um, a pointed location. But let's, let's try uh, the, the name uh, annotation. And, no, okay. Let's do this one. So how do you uh, draw uh, the box? You click um, under the name and you drag the line until the end of the word and then you, uh, you pull it up. And when you click to finish, uh, the window will appear again. So what you do, you transcribe what you're, say, what you're seeing, and please remember, don't, don't write the name as you know it, as is the preferred version of the name, but write exactly what you see on the map. So in this case, it's Papira. And then we tell Rekogito that we're talking about a place. Uh, the suggested match uh, that Rekogito offers us is really uh, not what we what we're looking for, so uh, let's try something else. It doesn't look like they have a, a match for material. If you cannot resolve your place with any of the available gazetteers, you could uh, click on flag display. So you are declaring that this place is unresolvable at the moment. However, uh, remember that sometimes the places are in the gazetteers, but they are there with another name, and Rikagito is not yet you know, uh, able to find all the possible um, spellings of the name. So if we try instead of the Arabic um, for, uh, for the city, the, the current Italian one, which is Matera, and we try looking again, there we have a match. And, and we can go with the, with the player, this one. Okay, and we actually resolved it. Now, uh, you, can, you can practice more uh, with the annotation of maps. That would be uh, all your exercise. Let's just very quickly uh, look at the um, other uh, options uh, that are the other features that are in Rekogito. Uh, let's have a look at the document settings, uh, just because if you want to um, do some collaborative annotation, uh, you have to um, go from the settings to sharing and write here the Rekogito username of the person that you want to invite. And then, uh, for example, we can invite Chiara here. Hi, Chiara. And then you choose the level of permission that you want to give if read, write, or being an admin. 
Um, if you want to make your document and your annotation visible to all, uh, so that everyone can see the annotation, can download the annotation, you have to select this uh, option. But this would be only um, available if, in the metadata, you have declared that you, the, the, the copyright status of the document allows, allows that. Um, last thing, the download options because we have annotated both text and images in a very uh, easy way almost playful way but we could export that annotations in um, various other formats um, for example in csv format that uh, will allow us to uh, use them in spreadsheets or to import them in gis software or uh, we could export that as RDF. We didn't realize we were writing RDF while annotating, but uh, we did. And um, if we download it, for example, as RDF XML, this is what we would see. So we have automatically exported the metadata and we have automatically exported um, the annotations in the uh, open annotation format that is what Chiara uh, showed you uh, before. Last for GeoSol Place, we also have uh, the opportunity to um, export in GeoJSON. Um, okay, now um, I'll, uh, I think that you have everything you need for your exercise. You will find some uh, maps of the world uh, besides uh, all the text. And so, I mean, from wherever you are, you will find something that is uh, that is familiar to you. We encourage you to, to try some um, collaborative annotation. Just remember, if you're doing it collaboratively, to refresh the page quite often, so you will see uh, you will you will see the other annotation appearing, and there will be uh, maybe less uh, overlap. Chiara, Valeria, thank you very much for this uh, rich common session about G annotation. Really, we have many, many things, and I can, mm -hmm. I think <laughs> we could go on for hours to discuss yes. about it. Two, two notes. Um, thank you for showing the annotation of the Odyssey. I think, well, one thing about Ithaca, uh, definitely, when you annotate, so first thing, this is interesting to see, so the combination of manual and automatic annotation, so we need both, and uh, and for, yes, Ithaca, a place or a settlement, in other cases, we have to be very careful what period of time, because we can have a, a place with the same name, but in, in different periods of time. And I think this is very interesting, so we can see the, the power <laughs> of digital annotations in the sense that thanks to this tool, we can represent a close relationship between the text, the context, and in this case, uh, uh, geographic names, because uh, you can really say Ithaca in this case is uh, <laughs> Ithaca in this period of time. Uh, and also for home, this is really very interesting. In this case, home is this, and then if we search for home, uh, then we can see in our documents what is the the, what is meant. So I think this is really interesting. So we can represent the annotation within really within the context, not outside the context. But now, so I have to stop, and uh, I don't know if there are questions. We have guests in the, in the Hangout. I also put links in the, in the live chat in YouTube, on YouTube. So, please, uh, questions, notes. <laughs> No questions? in our hangout so i'm looking at the youtube on youtube we have 11 people i can also add that in recogito really we have many uh, new uh, things because I remember when uh, <clears throat> I was uh, annotating 
the Barmar Parium just two years ago, it was different, of course, it was already very powerful, but now, so the tool is really developing uh, a lot. They are implementing the tool, which is great. And another thing, of course, we need is uh, uh, collecting data. That's the, the, the problem we have in the sense that we need authority lists in general for name entities, in this specific case for uh, geographic names. And the problem is that we need them also in the original language, for example, for Greek. Uh, we need names, Greek is, a, is an inflected language, and we need um, <laughs> the forms of a uh, toponym uh, in Greek in, in, different, uh, in different forms. And so that's why this tool is, is really fundamental, and we encourage people to upload uh, their text and to, to annotate them. In this case, uh, um, the tool is really very helpful because you get a lot of automatic annotations then you have to, to correct it but you can uh, learn <laughs> a lot in other cases of course the problem is to disambiguate proper names i know that i'm working on fragments and uh, on greek historical fragments where we have a lot of proper names but sometimes you have to check this is a personal name or a place name because really there are unknown <laughs> places and so you can check other sources lexic and so on so we still have uh, five minutes i had a i had another question yes, yes um, i was just wondering whether recognito is when you when it tries to disambiguate a place and wh or whether you, when you ask for it to search for a place is that doing a live search across the data sets of Pleiades, Geonames, Past Place, and all the other gazetteers, or, I mean, my assumption has to be that it's not. It must have, it must have aggregated that information somewhere because it would be very slow if it did a live search, wouldn't it? And the reason I ask is because if you then add, um, say, for example, there were a project that were about to add 4,500 Arabic names to Pleiades, um, just for example, um, how quickly would, Recogito know about that content? I, I don't really know. Um, uh, yeah, I assume it's not a live search, but I don't know how often it is um, updated. Um, I, I might ask, uh, but I, I wouldn't know for sure. I don't know if Chiara is more... Um, I'm pretty sure it does aggregation. Um, it does aggregation towards a list of gazetteers that is not complete at the moment. Um, but it should be updated um, pretty frequently, actually. So uh, I'm pretty sure that the new information that is stored, I don't know how frequently play it is, is um, sort of massive uh, update stage. But uh, I'm pretty sure that the updates in Recogito are pretty frequent. Right, thank you. Okay, other questions? I've got another question if nobody else does. Yeah. Um, could um, could one of you um, or both of you say um, say more about annotating non-textual objects? Um, the so we, we we saw maps, but in a sense we're annotating the text on the maps. Um, could we think about how we would annotate, um, for example, you know, a, 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 a mosaic representing the city of Jerusalem and the, the, the various monuments within that, or um, a relief representing a personification of um, of an ancient place in some in some way. Could we could we tag could we tag an image as representing um, well, as linking to a place, etc. Sorry for interrupting. In the map, you showed that there were mountains. If I, if I remember correct, so there is, for example, do we want also to uh, annotate something like that? So the the, the, the drawing of mountains. Right. Like, oh, if if they are um, if they are images, uh, what Recogito does is just you know it's selecting a part of the image and you annotate that. So if you have the image, the, the digital reproduction of 
a mosaic with buildings that are in some gazetteer if you want to resolve them as you know some of them are in player there's not many but some of them are uh, you could select an area and say this is a place and the match for this place is the uri in the gazetteer if you can resolve it otherwise you can just uh, tag it annotate it saying this is a building in jerusalem i believe it's this building that is named, I don't know, maybe in some literary source, so I can identify the building is maybe the, you know, the, the synagogue is the temple is uh, something. Um, I wouldn't see any particular problem with this, any, any actual practical difference from treating these other images from uh, how you treat uh, maps. I don't know if Chiara wants to, to add something to that. Yeah, there is there is absolutely no practical difference in annotating a map as an image and a mosaic or an inscription as an image. Uh, the only thing that you have to, to pay attention to is the kind of semantical jump that you make from um, the actual representation of a place and, for example, the personifications of the same place. Um, you have to be quite careful with that because if you um, find a personification of Athens, just to, to make an example, um, that have a discussion about the actual identification, the actual reference of it to the actual place of Athens. If if that is an option, uh, what are you trying to do with that type of annotation? Uh, so that is a quite uh, an example of a quite advanced semantic annotation. But give, provided that you are consistent, provided that you have a system to clarify what type of semantic annotation you're doing. I don't see any difficulty in doing that. And the fact that there's no text in your annotation is not a problem. There's nothing to transcribe. No, the only the only problem that I see, I mean, as a tool. Yeah, the only problem that I see would be probably in the export format, because I don't think that you would be able to export. Um, but I'm not sure if there are ways to uh, export a single um, contents in the squares because I haven't worked on that. Right, because what Recogito exports is the coordinates of the square you've drawn. Um, yeah. And it would just be exported without a label. Yeah. Because you wouldn't have been able to give it a label on the, as, as when you when you tag the letters material, you wouldn't get, uh, you wouldn't have any label to put in there. Yeah, this is something similar to the image citation tool, so you can annotate the portion of an image, any image, and you will get an identifier, so an inscription, an image, uh, something like that. So, yeah. Okay, now, <laughs> as you can see, the discussion is very, very interesting, but our time is over. So thank you all for this first common session, really. I'm very happy about that. We will meet next week, next Thursday, February the 2nd at 5 p.m. Central European time. Next week we have Gabriel Baudera and uh, Simona Stoyanova with a session on encoding of ancient texts. As usual, I will post uh, the link to the Google Hangout and uh, to the YouTube channel. So thank you all. Good night and see you next week. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. See you next Bye. week. Bye.